Hello, it's Father Samuel Hakim with No Before You Go for the third Sunday in Easter. Well, happy continued Easter to all of you. As we continue to march through the season, our readings unfold or further expand the mysteries of the resurrection. Of course, it all started back on Easter Sunday. Christ is risen. He has defeated death, trampled over it by death itself. The sign of the cross becomes the sign of new life, and indeed, Christ has arisen. Then last Sunday, we celebrated Divine Mercy Sunday, a reminder that this resurrection given to us comes to us as mercy, that God's mercy truly and does endure forever, as the Psalms tell us. Today, we continue down that path of mercy in our readings, especially mercy as experienced in the forgiveness of our sins. We have a beautiful first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. We'll hear from the Acts of the Apostles for the entire Easter season, in fact, in our first readings. And right now, in this early part of that book, we're focused on Peter and his preaching mission. He and John set out together, empowered by the Holy Spirit after Pentecost, and begin to preach Jesus Christ. And they have massive success right off the bat, thousands upon thousands coming to belief in Christ and being baptized. But it's not all just great success. There's some persecution as well, especially from the authorities, who are a little bit nervous. Here is this Jesus whom they have put to death. It's supposed to be over, right? Yet here are at least two people preaching in his name, continuing to spread that news. It's a threat to them, so they try to shut them up. But they're in a bit of a conundrum because the people are praising God and what they've seen and what they've experienced. They don't want people to stop praising God, but this Jesus thing is still too new for them. Still too much. And yet, despite that, Peter boldly preaches in the name of Jesus. He says, how could I not share the news that God has given me to share? How did Peter get to this point? You know, think about it. Before the crucifixion, he runs away. He runs into hiding. He denies even knowing Jesus Christ. Now, he preaches his name boldly. The threat of death is no less than it was before. In fact, you could say the threat of death is even greater than it was before the crucifixion. And yet, he preaches. And indeed, eventually, will be put to death for what it is that he is doing. But I'd like to think that the forgiveness that he received from Jesus after Jesus' resurrection is what allows him to go forward so boldly. This restoration of a relationship with Jesus. We know the story well. It was on the shore of the lake, the Sea of Galilee. Jesus appears to the apostles once more. They're out there fishing. We have this dramatic scene at the very end of John's gospel. Jesus and Peter walking along the shore. Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Three times, he asks. Three times, Peter responds, a little bit more distressed with each time. Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus responds, feed my sheep. And so he does. But listen to the boldness in what Peter says here in his proclamation of the kerygma, his proclamation of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. He said to the people, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in Pilate's presence when he had decided to release him. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. The author of life you put to death. But God raised him from the dead. Of this we are witnesses. 
Now, if we stopped there in this reading, in this proclamation from Peter, we might expect the next words out of his mouth to say, shame on you. We might expect him to come down very harshly on the people of Israel, the people to whom he is preaching. We might expect him to say, you messed up. And there's nothing left for you. Game over. But again, he's received this mercy from Jesus Christ. He's encountered that mercy firsthand. He's received forgiveness due to his repentance, his reaching out in love to Jesus. And so listen how he continues. Now, I know, brothers, that you acted out of ignorance, just as your leaders did. But God has thus brought to fulfillment what he has announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be wiped away. It's because of your ignorance that this happened, he said. He sort of gives them the fairest reading possible. I know that you did wrong. I know that it was horrible. You put our Lord to death, the one who is God himself. But you did it because you didn't know. It sounds like familiar words, words we've heard from Jesus. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. You see, that, that mercy that Peter received earlier has begun to transform his life. And his life begins to imitate that of Jesus' life. He calls these Israelites into repentance. Repent, you will be forgiven. Repent and be baptized. Yes, what you did was wrong, but that's not the end of the story. I think sometimes we can lose sight of the significance of opportunities for repentance. Sometimes we want to just sort of say, okay, well, Christ wiped away our sins and we're done. It doesn't really matter what I do now. I'm forgiven. I don't have to be so aware of my sinfulness because Christ has lifted me out of that. It's done. The victory is given to us. We can move forward confidently and boldly in Christ. And while we don't want to dwell on our sinfulness too much, it is important that we realize the wrong that we have done. Think about it. Every time we come to Mass, what do we begin with? We begin by acknowledging our sins so that we can be prepared to celebrate the mysteries. Because if it weren't for our sinfulness, then we'd have no need of a Savior. So it's because we have fallen, it's because we have sinned, that we also receive that life with Jesus Christ. It's because of our sinfulness, precisely because of our sinfulness, that Christ yearns to save us, to draw us into relationship with him. We hear it too in this second reading from the first letter of John. In fact, it's all over the first letter of John. He says, if you say you are without sin, then you have made him a liar. But when we acknowledge our sins, when we acknowledge our sinfulness and receive his mercy, it is then that we are made whole. It is then that we are brought into the life of this resurrection. So just like Peter received mercy and became merciful, well, so have we also received mercy. We've received that mercy from God, first in our baptism then each time we come forward to the sacrament of reconciliation, each time we come to Mass and acknowledge our sinfulness and our need for God, he can't help but pour it out upon us. But is our life changed by that mercy? Do we, in turn, become merciful to others? Can we, just like Peter did, face our enemies, both large and small, and say, I forgive you. Truly say and truly mean, I forgive you. Not just I forgive you, but I desire to be in relationship with you. 
I desire that you receive what I too have received. That's what it means to be on fire with the Holy Spirit. That's when that encounter with the mercy of God is complete. When we can become that same mercy and call others to love of Christ. This is the gift of the resurrection, that we're not bound by our sinfulness, but always given new opportunities to try again, new opportunities to grow even deeper in love, new opportunities to know our Lord. So may we be preachers of that great mercy as we share the goodness of the gospel, the goodness of the resurrection of Christ. Touched by that mercy ourselves, may we too become images of God's mercy here on this earth, calling all people to repentance, calling all people to great love of Jesus Christ. Happy Easter, and God bless.